Welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, a look back at the history of medicine and healthcare. Today's video is on the history of smallpox. This dreadful pandemic that we're going through has shown us more than ever just how vital vaccines are. And these new coronavirus vaccines may be our best shot at things finally returning back to normal. But this is by no means the first time that vaccines have come to our rescue. And trust me, it definitely won't be the last time either. So in this video, I want to talk about the biggest success story that we've ever had with vaccines, which is the successful eradication of smallpox. But for you to fully appreciate just how important its eradication was, let's first take a look at the history of the disease. There's actually two variants of smallpox, variola minor, which had a death rate of 1%, and variola major, which killed about 30% of the people it infected. The initial symptoms of smallpox started off quite similar to the common cold or flu, but then rashes began to erupt all over the skin after a few days, and in the most severe cases, the virus would attack blood vessels causing the victim to bleed from several organs simultaneously, leading them to literally bleed to death. So you can tell it was a horrible disease to have, and even many who survived it had long-term effects like permanent blindness. The earliest 100% confirmed death from smallpox was in Egypt around 3,000 years ago, which was confirmed by researchers who analysed the mummy from around that time, and for the thousands of years following this, smallpox was regularly causing devastating epidemics in the old world continents of Europe, Africa and Asia. So smallpox caused a lot of problems in the old world, being one of the leading killers in the past, but when it was first introduced to human populations that had never experienced the virus, it became especially fatal. This happened when European colonists brought the virus to the Native Americans in the 15th century or the Aboriginals in the 18th century, which caused a death rate of over 80% in these populations and probably made the process of colonisation much easier. Europeans also gave the Americans diseases like malaria, yellow fever and cholera, but they didn't get off scot-free as they received syphilis in return which interestingly is how smallpox got its name. The rashes that form in the early stages of variola and syphilis look fairly similar in appearance, but since syphilis was a new disease and people were more scared of it, the English called it the great pox, whereas variola was called smallpox. But don't let those names confuse you, because in the short term, smallpox was a much more deadly disease. This was obviously a disease that people had to get rid of, as it was wreaking havoc on humanity, with no herd immunity in sight. So you shouldn't be too surprised that smallpox was the first ever disease that a vaccine was produced against. And even though things like germ theory and the inner workings of the immune system was only discovered in the late 19th century, People have always known that once you survive a contagious disease the first time round, the second time you're infected with it will most likely be much milder, because your body would have trained itself to fight it. So therefore, it might be possible that if you can find a way to introduce a weaker or partial form of the disease, then maybe your body might be able to train itself for when the real form invades. The first example of artificial immunisation to smallpox comes from China all the way back in the 10th century. They employed a method that involved taking the skin scabs from people that suffered a mild form of smallpox and then blowing it into the noses of healthy people. 
Methods similar to this were also reported to have occurred in Africa, India and Persia not long after this. But when the method was finally introduced to Europe in the 1700s, they called it variolation after the Latin name for smallpox. This method actually seemed to work fairly well, as data collectors of the time found that only 2% of people died after being variolated, which is a pretty good trade-off for the up to 30% chance of dying from smallpox if you ask me. But there were many downsides to this method, as 2% is by no means a small number, and some variolated people also died by giving themselves other deadly diseases like syphilis or tuberculosis so a better method of immunisation was definitely needed. The person that would introduce a better method was the now famous English doctor Edward Jenner. Variolation to smallpox had become extremely common around this time and he himself was variolated as a young boy. But around the time he was doing his medical training, he and many other doctors started to realise that there was one particular group of people who never seemed to suffer from smallpox, even if they hadn't been variolated. Milkmaids. But because of all the close-up contacts these milkmaids had with cows, they always seemed to get cowpox, which was quite similar to smallpox, but was a much milder disease, and was pretty much never fatal. So that led Jenna to believe that there must be some kind of cross-reactivity going on here, meaning that a previous cowpox infection might actually make you immune to smallpox. He tested this hypothesis out in 1796 on a young boy called James Phipps, the 80-year-old son of Jenna's gardener. Jenna took some pus from the cowpox sores of a local milkmaid and then scratched it into the young boy's arm. Just as he expected, the boy suffered a few days of mild symptoms and then fully recovered. He then left the poor boy alone for about two months and then infected his arm with a smallpox scab, but this had absolutely no effect on the child. So young James Phipps was immune and the experiment was a success. Jenner would repeat this method on many of his patients and then he published his findings to the Royal Society of London dubbing this new method of immunisation the variola vaccinia with the second word coming from the Latin word for cow, vacca. This is where the term vaccination comes from and over the next few decades Jenner's relatively safer method of vaccination would gradually replace the more dangerous variolation all over the world. As people everywhere started to see just how successful this vaccine was, Many countries began to make vaccination from smallpox mandatory for older citizens. And as you might expect, these laws did spark a lot of controversy in many of these countries because some people believed it was an infringement to their liberty. However, even in the freedom-loving United States, the Supreme Court made a ruling in 1905 that a single person's liberty is overruled by the government's duty to keep the population safe. So they therefore decided that mandatory vaccination laws were indeed constitutional. This decision was clearly the right one, as deaths from smallpox rapidly started to decline wherever they were made mandatory. This graph here shows just how big of an impact smallpox vaccination had in London and you can see similar trends in many developed countries with a national vaccination program, with most of these countries declaring that they had officially eliminated smallpox by the 1950s. But smallpox was still killing about 2 million people a year in less developed countries around this time, so the World Health Organization decided to step in. The WHO initiated the Global Smallpox Eradication Program in 1959. 
The plan was to identify every single case of smallpox that occurred anywhere in the world, rapidly isolate or quarantine the infected people, and then vaccinate everyone who lived close by. The estimated cost of this program is thought to have been over $300 million, and this effort brought cases down from around 50 million a year in the early 1950s to just the occasional cluster in the Horn of Africa in 1975. So seeing how much the COVID-19 pandemic has cost the world in a single year, this was definitely money well spent. The last ever naturally occurring smallpox case was in Somalia in 1977, and the last person to die from it was Janet Parker in 1978, a 40-year-old medical photographer who accidentally got the virus while working at a lab in the University of Birmingham Medical School. But on 8th of May 1980, the WHO officially declared that smallpox had been eradicated worldwide. After the tragic lab incident in Birmingham, the World Health Organization ordered that every single lab with smallpox samples must destroy the stockpiles. So today, only two places in the whole world hold smallpox samples. A lab run by the US Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, and one run by the Russian Vector Institute for Virology in Siberia. Debates are currently ongoing about whether to finally destroy these last two stockpiles, but both countries have resisted any moves to do so because of the very realistic chance of the other country using it as a means of biological warfare. If you want to lose some sleep tonight, you can research how that Russian lab has been involved in extensive research in using infectious diseases for biological weaponry. But for now, smallpox remains the only ever human disease to be eradicated, and with the continued progression of vaccine technology, more diseases will hopefully follow it.